In the Emerald Isle, something unexplainable is happening. Tonight, prepare to witness the most frightening event in horror podcast history. A journey into the depths of horror history. First Class Horror presents The Class Horror Cast. Evil wears many masks, but pure horror wears only one. Support First Class Horror on Patreon for as little as one dollar. Can't get enough of the horror? Carve yourself a deal from official merchandise only on Teespring. Join us on all social media at First Class Horror. We have such sights to show you. Thomas Fenton is a screenwriter whose credits include I Spit on Your Grave 2, Saw 4, Chain Letter, Slay Preview, Max Payne, and many more. While working relentlessly on undisclosed projects, Thomas found the time to write The Screenwriter's Handbook, How to Write a Terrifying Screenplay in 10 Bloody Steps. Tom's 10-step approach shares a proven process for developing story ideas, characters, and dialogue. You'll learn the rule of three and how to build your own arsenal of horror to craft a terrifying screenplay. Throughout the book, Tom shares his wisdom in a no-bullshit way and gets straight to the point. Whether you're an aspiring screenwriter, student, or horror fan, this book is a must-read. Tom and I discuss his journey in life, Hollywood, his passion projects, prop collecting, real-life ghost stories, and much, much more. I hope you guys enjoy this conversation as much as I did. The, the first thing I really wanted to ask you about was how, how did you first become introduced to movies or was that something that started at a young age or? Oh yeah, yeah, it did. It, uh, my, uh, I've, I've only made uh, films. I, um, I come from Rochester, New York, which is a small, smaller city in upstate New York, um, which is on the Canadian border. It's late on Lake Ontario. And, um, uh, Rochester is the home of Eastman Kodak company. And being a child of the seventies and eighties, um, born in the sixties, uh, film was the predominant, uh, medium. And, um, my father was in charge of the, um, print, uh, print paper. So if you ever had a photograph taken basement Kodak in from 1968 to say 1984, he made the paper that it went on. And he, uh, he had, uh, the Kodak had something called the camera club, which allowed free film and free developing and, 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 uh, really, I would, I was about to say motion picture cameras, but they're not motion picture cameras. They're Kodak super eight load and shoot cameras. There's no, there's fixed, there are fixed focal lengths. Chances are they were parallax view. They weren't at all advanced, but he'd bring those home and I'd shoot these films with my friends, um, over the weekend and we'd shoot everything from, um, I remember one opus was Frankenstein versus the werewolf. And, uh, nice. my brother, my younger brother played the cop and he was, my, mo- my brother must've been six. I was maybe 10. And, um, we had these little vignettes and we would shoot these things constantly. And I, I ended up falling in with a crowd of, um, later, uh, in say eighth grade, I met some, uh, some guys and went to, uh, uh, the Harley school in Rochester and we all loved film and we started making films and I'm happy to say that before, you know, fan films today are very of a thing. They're, they're very, they're out there, but my friends and I were the first, well, one of the first people to make like a Star Trek. We we're big Star Trek fans, TOS, Spock, Kirk and McCoy, um, fan film when we were in eighth grade. So I've always made films. I've always worked. I've always written stories. They, were, they weren't very good back then. A lot of them had to deal with, um, you know, they were ripoffs of other movies, right? But this time I'd always learn how to start yeah. writing is because I was just r- ripping off. I'd write my version of the road warrior, but with, with, with my friends in it, you know? And, and that would always start that way. Would it like, you wouldn't just yeah. shoot something randomly. You would, you would always put, no, I'd, 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 I'd come up with a pseudo script. Um, uh, you know, I, I mentioned this in my book, the screenwriter's handbook. I have to, I have to plug the book every once in a while <laughs> that I'm dyslexic. And, um, this being the early mid seventies, um, there's no technology to help a dyslexic. So, um, and my, and I didn't learn to read and write until about, um, I went to parochial school, um, uh, St. Thomas the Apostle in, in Rochester and, and bless them. They were, they were fine people, but the dyslexia hadn't, be, 
they didn't know what that was yet. They didn't know what learning disabilities were. So they treated me as a, um, uh, an adult child and was not, uh, afforded much grace. Let's put it that way. I'm being, I'm being kind. Um, <laughs> I can imagine. And so writing was very difficult for me and it still is, it's still a challenge. I still sped, I still spell bed with a five, but, um, this, the technology has kind of caught up with me. Uh, but I would write these, these little scripts and we would shoot these, uh, uh, pieces of uh, a film and hopefully, you know, it turned into something decent. Sometimes it was very fun. I had, st- I have them all still. I still watch them. I said, uh, they're great time capsules. Lots of, lots of Bruce Lee influenced things back in the seventies. Oh, yeah. 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 Lots of Kung Fu, man. Lots of Kung Fu. And how did you, um, how did you like when, when you started to kind of get into the business, maybe later on, how did you cope with, with that, like writing, you know, huge professional scripts that um well what the, the, in, the, in the interim i um i became a grip okay. um i went to i went to film school didn't learn much i learned how to watch other people's films and critique them which which isn't the reason i went to film school and um i didn't do it too well because i was far more interested in um the girls than i was <laughs> the courses and um but I, I ended up working at 18 i got a job this is the answer to your question by the way it's a roundabout i worked on a movie called lady in white um, I was 18. Um, it's a really good, if you haven't seen it, it's a really good movie. It's, um, it's Spielberg done, uh, ghost story. I'll tell you what the, the director, Frank Willows is going to kill me for saying that, but it's true. It's very, it's very good. Uh, he, Frank Willows also made a really cool movie, uh, called, um, fear no evil. You seen that? Uh, fear no evil. I have. Yes. Yeah, it's a good movie. It's pretty wild. That's like 1980, 1981. Yes, exactly, exactly. And um, so off that, I started my film career. Uh, that that job on Lady White was I was the video assist operator. So I sat next to Frank Lelogia the whole time, and uh, was paid a hundred bucks a week. And I slept on a couch, but I had the time of my life. And I still to this day, after doing all the movies I've done thus far, and continue to do, it's still one of the best experiences I've ever had. And I'm, I often tell Lelogia. If, if he had been a dick to me, I probably wouldn't have cho- chosen his career because I was at one point I was going to be a drummer and I was going to choose which career, which is, by the way, you know, these are the two things I'm going to choose between being a filmmaker and being a drummer. No, not like, you know, medicine or lawyer, you know, <laughs> I'm picking two things that are equally impossible to make money at. And um, from then I became a key grip and then um, a gaffer and then I used to shoot some stuff. But while I was a key in Mobile, Alabama, I was doing a movie with Michael Ironside called Night Trap, uh, or Mardi Gras for the Devil, I think is what they was released, released it as. And, and Michael Ironside is a very, very talented man, and Robert Davi was in this movie. And I actually got my SAG card from that because I played a cop in it, and I was had a scene with Robert Davi, who would not let me reference Die Hard. He would always get mad at me for referencing Die Hard. From that, um, with the producer of that movie said, we're trying to make this movie – like basic instinct had just hit and they were wanting to make a low budget version of that. And they said, you know, you always fancy yourself a writer. Do you have any ideas? And so I went to my, but I, we wrapped on a Friday night and Saturday morning I woke up and I wrote like four or five different ideas and I pitched them the ideas really poorly because pitching is an art that I had yet to learn. He really liked them and he that you should write some stuff. So when I wrapped that job from Mobile, I went back to Cleveland where I was living at the time, Cleveland, Ohio. Mm-hmm. I was married and had a house and stuff and started writing screenplays. And the, you know, if anyone's listening to this and they want to start writing, they, they have to realize that unless you're Tarantino or, um, Paul Schrader or David Mamet, probably, I don't know about David Mamet, but your first screenplay is going to be terrible. You have to get the garbage out of the way first. And mine were, so tracking with a great career, I had terrible screenplays, but I thought I had hung the moon when I wrote them. I thought they were fantastic. And so from that, I gradually, I, I had a production company. But at that point, I was non-linear editing. NLE editing had just started in the mid-90s. I got uh, involved in that. But I was also writing scripts at night. And so what I did was, while well, I was in Cleveland, I had this company, and uh, write these scripts at night. And I wrote one that people really liked. It was called The Dominion. And it was about, um, and this was, I'm a hobbyist at this point, right? Um, it's about a, a guy, a New Orleans police officer who's killed in the line of duty, uh, but is resurrected by an angel and becomes half man, half angel. And in, in, for the first time, you know, recorded history, a, a human starts to get involved with the, Arma, the war for Armageddon. 
And um, it was very, very dark and very, it was kind of like an X-Files meets the Exorcist is how I pitched it. Okay. And I wrote this and a dear friend of mine, Alan McElroy, who wrote Halloween 4 and Spawn, read it and thought it was really great. And said, uh, I have a deal with uh, Wind Dance. Was it Wind Dance? It's Forrest Whitaker's company. Sky uh, Dance? No, it wasn't Sky Dance. Uh, do, you know what, do you know what it is? Wind Dance? Uh, anyway, it's, it's a company. He said that he might like it. So he, he, he shopped it around. And we've got some traction. So well, well, that was being shopped. I sat down and I wrote um, the, the script that broke me. Um, it, was, it was called Blood of Legend. It's King Arthur versus Prince Dracula. It was, um, it was, it was, it was uh, well, Lord of the Rings meets Excalibur. And um, that script, to this day, is still one of my best samples. And I wrote it relatively quickly. And then when I finished it, my wife at the time said we should move to L.A. and we should really give this a go. Because I already had, I had traction with Dominion. I had written another script called Dusted about... Um, futuristic cyber warfare and cloning and stuff. And people seem to dig that too. So I said, well, let's give it a shot. And when you're doing that, would you, do you start a script and then finish that before you move on? Or can you like, would you go between scripts? How? Well, my, my process used to be, I used to, uh, what I used to call rock and roll writing, which is, I just kind of sat down and started writing Mm -hmm. and that, and that works. Uh, if you're trying to find your voice, I think that's very, uh, it's an interesting way to go. There's a lot of work because you end up doing a lot of rewriting. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I, I used to, I don't do it as much. I'm about to get back into it, but I used to have about five scripts going at once. Wow. Lately, in the past few years, I've, I've, I've backed off a little bit because, quite frankly, um, I've been so entrenched in this one project and I was, I'm, I'm pitching stuff all the time. Like even today, I have three or four pitches. They're not scripts, but there's different takes on different movies and different projects around town. Uh, so I'm always writing a bunch of stuff at once. Um, back then, uh, I, I didn't I didn't approach this like I should have, and I didn't approach it like a job. I uh, approached it like a um, an enthusiastic hobby. And and what I mean by that is, uh, to be the best you can, you have to outline or card card then outline a script because. There's a there's a lot of magic in sitting down and discovering the script. It's and letting the script dictate to you what it is, and that's really cool. But unless you have um, a clear way forward, or at least not even a clear way forward, just a way forward, you're, you're just going to spin your wheels. And I tell you something, my, a dear friend of mine, Penn Dengem, who wrote Prince of Thieves for the Kevin Costner movie and tons of other stuff, had said to me many times, the worst thing can, the worst thing that a writer can do is face a blank page. So you walk in knowing something about what you're going to write about, even if it's like researching. So when I was doing, um, geez, I, when I was doing Max Payne, um, I, I played Max Payne all the time, and I researched like John Woo gun movies, you know. So mm-hmm. even though I wasn't writing yet, and, and Max Payne's kind of weird because it was a script already. The, the, the rock star already had a script for that, but I'm trying to think of what else. But you do just a ton of research, and then when you sit down, like writing's the last thing you do. Okay. I don't know if that was the answer to your question, man, but that's that's the one I've given you. Yeah, no, it, like it, I, I I always kind of I'm always kind of interested in that because uh, I've talked to different people and and then you maybe find out you know they had a take and it was like you know um, there's there's another podcast there that I I would like to plug as well um, called Best Movies Never Made and mm. basically they talk wow. to writers and stuff that I'm assuming when it gets to the point where we've acknowledged that the script or whatever will never be picked up. You know, it's kind of just dead, but they will talk yeah. about, you know, their take on maybe Texas Chainsaw or whatever it might be. It's interesting to see how many plates sometimes people spin at the one time. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, know I was always kind of intrigued by, you know, how that process works for, for different people. Well, you know, the thing, the thing, uh, first off, uh, if, uh, I also would like to plug best movies never made because I tell you what, if you guys are interested, I have the best story about Big Trouble in Little China too. Oh, nice. Yeah, I've got, nice. I've got that. I've got Tron. I've got, I've got, man. I tell you what, I've got, I've got an alien in there somewhere. We need to make that. Was alien three? Yeah. Um, and because and that and that actually harkens well with what I'm about to say is that you, 
in this business, you don't know what's going to pay you. So you do a lot of things at once and you have to be a really good multitasker to keep these plates in the air because only one plate's going to pay you. One or two might hit, but, um, you have to, uh, be like, I would always like when I said I had five things, I always had a spec, two takes. I'd always be developing or, or optioning a novel that I was writing. I might find a novel that I like, or maybe a remake of a film that I've been working on. Like remakes have been like the thing for the past, you know, near 10 years. But, um, you know, you have to have all these things going on. You have to find, be finding IP. You have to be writing IP, um, to, and, and cause every buyer is a little different. And when I mean buyer, because I'm independent, somebody who works for a producer that works for Netflix is going to be looking at something differently than somebody who works for, who has a deal with Amazon, who has a deal with one of the studios, you know, they're all a little different. Yeah. yeah. So you have to kind of have this, uh, quiver of different kinds of arrows mm-hmm. ready to go. And they all have to be, for me, at least they have to be in the same wheelhouse. They'll have to be like, I have like literally at one point, I, I, maybe I'm not doing this movie anymore. Cause I think maybe I got the brush off yesterday, but there was a movie I was developing with a guy. Um, he said, well, you know, the budget's $3 million for this, but also be prepared to write it for 300,000. Cause we can do that tomorrow or whatever. I said, yeah, sure, man. As long as, as long as I have ownership and gross, I don't care. You know, as long as it's cool. Um, because they, they, you have to be very pliable. Yeah, yeah, and you have to yeah. go a lot of ways. I mean, there's always that one dude that shows up with a, with, a, with the first spec and nails it, and then never looks back. But um, that's rare. That's very rare. Yeah, yeah. And is there uh, obviously? I know there's probably stuff you can't talk about and whatever. Is is there a, a an existing IP out there that you always wanted to do or? Oh, there's a lot of I want to do, but the one I'm doing at the moment, which I, I, I tried to actually, I think I emailed you on this. I was going to announce mm-hmm. it on your podcast, but I can't because the, I haven't heard back from the second producer. Um, we've been, we, I'll, I will say, though, it's a, it's one of the most famous ghost stories of all time. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's been made once. And we're retelling the story, the actual real story. And um, it's very scary and very cool. Um but I mean, I would love, you know, I would love to get my hands on the thing I've been dreaming to get my hands on. And it's not really in my wheelhouse. It's probably why I haven't gotten it, but I'd love to get Flash Gordon. Really? Yeah. I love Flash Gordon. I think Flash Gordon is great because Flash Gordon, Arthur C. Clarke once said that um, um, at one point technology gets so advanced, it appears to, to lesser people as magic. That's not the exact quote, but that's what Flash Gordon is kind of based on, like this crazy technology that's so cool that you think it's magic. See that? And that's what like, that defines Flash Gordon from like say a Star Trek or Star Wars, although Star Wars is fantasy. I've always loved Flash Gordon. Maybe it's the Queen soundtrack. I don't know what it is, but it's something I've always wanted to do, and I've I've pursued it for years. I also pursued Buck Rogers, um, uh, and you know, and for a brief period of time, I was on Tron, um, the Tron sequel. It was Tron two point oh before it was Tron Legacy, and that was back in like um. Oh three or oh four, and that was when sequels weren't a thing yet. And yeah, but it was just—it's just, it's been, just yeah. fun, fun, fun to mess around in that universe, you know. But and there's there's a that's, there's a ton of stuff I'd like to get my hands on. And as regards, in I, uh, I guess in in horror, is there anyone in particular that's always stuck out, or just the one that I'm doing now? Yeah, yeah. That, that's you mean kind of the, the one you kind of uh, got uh, the golden goose? Yeah, I, th- I think so. I think it's really cool. At one point. Um, I'm a big, like, I'm a huge John Carpenter fan. Mm-hmm. And it was at one point, um, this is in 01. No, 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 03. I got to town in 01, so it must have been two or three. Um, I met, was at, I was at Universal, and I I was developing, I, it was 04 because I was, the Saw was happening. Uh, I was developing a script with them called Creator, and it was a kind of a, uh, we hadn't used the word reboot all the time, but it was a reboot of a mad scientist movie. It was a, it was a, ge- a mad geneticist. It was like, okay. so it was a new take on the mad scientist thing. And, um, he had, he had, this guy had drawn these weary, tra- it was supposed to be shot in Bulgaria, these weary travelers into his web and he like had altered their DNA and stuff and like created all these crazy creatures. And these people could stumble across this castle that he's in. It was this crazy movie, <clears throat> but they go, now what else do you want to do? Well, we're doing this. I said, well, I, I've always wanted, I'd like to, I hate to use the word remake, but I, I'd like to do another version of the thing. And um, they go, "What's the thing?" And they go, well, you guys made it in '82. 
We did? Yeah, he did. Well, I, was, I, I just got here from Disney, man, so I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so I, I, I reach into my bag, and I pull out the 82 Carpenter DVD. And I go, this movie? They go, oh, that movie? I said, yeah, that movie. Goes, oh, who's seen that movie? I said, yeah, I know you guys, you know, you did the post-production downstairs. And uh, then I pull out the Howard Hawks version, the 50, I think it's 54. And I said, I want to marry these two. I want to, because this Howard Hawks is based on who goes there. And John Carpenter's 82 is ba- loosely based on who goes there and with some ultra. And I wanted to marry the two. Yeah. And, um, and I, they go, okay, well, what's your take? I said, well, we still keep it in the, the Arctic. We're still at the, um, I can't remember the name of the station at the moment. Um, survey station or whatever it's called survey station, something, something it's in the middle of the Arctic and we're all alone. And the guy and the guy and the, the bitch goes, he puts his hand, it goes up red flag, man. Um, the snow's expensive. And I said, I know it is, but it can't be like, and he goes, can it be like in downtown Los Angeles? I said, no, it can't because this is an organism that feeds off other organisms. It has, it has to be like, they have to be isolated. So I knew the pitch wasn't going to go well if they already had a problem with snow. Yeah. <laughs> And that happens a lot, by the way. You'll get that a lot. I had that. I, I wrote a werewolf movie for Kate Hudson um, in 05. And I was working with Stan Winston's company. The, oh, the, nice. a, company called, a company called Cosmic, which was Kurt Russell and uh, Goldie oh. Hawn and Oliver Hudson and Kate Hudson. Had a company called Cosmic run by my dear friend Jay Cohen and John, Sal- John Salberg and Jay Schinderman. We were doing this movie called Red. It was Little Red Riding Hood grown up to be a werewolf hunter. And um, for Katie, because Katie wanted to do her Tomb Raider, and we were doing this, and 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 we were teamed up with Winston to do the effects. And I'm pitching, I'm pitching the, I'm pitching the companies. The companies have assembled in this beautiful conference room down in Beverly Hills, and I'm like, okay, here's this movie, and I, I start by saying it's this deep because I want to retell the story of Little Red Riding Hood going through the wilderness and stuff, and I kind of reintroduce the kind of classic grim way, and then spin it quickly. And I go, it's a setup, it's this cottage, it's in this woods, and it's kind of a primal woods, you know, probably hasn't seen, you know, mankind 1,500 years or whatever, <laughs> couldn't set up. Dude raised his hand, um, red flag, uh, that sounds expensive. And I said, well, it's not, it's a soundstage, and it's really small, but because we're shooting a kid, you don't even get to the girl, like, there's a little girl. So the set doesn't have to be that big, because it's a little girl. You know, so when you're pitching these things, and it really throws your vibe off, man. I got news for you, man. You spend like three months getting ready for this pitch. And I got a great James Cameron story too. But um, And they they, throw, they say something that completely throws you off your game because a lot of pitching is performance. Because yeah. the secret to pitching is you're, you're, not, you're not telling you the movie. You're telling the movie as you see it in your head. So you're pitching them like, like I was to pitch you Star Wars. Like I saw this amazing movie, man. It's deep space. And suddenly the sky cracks open by this giant spaceship roaring overhead. And it's firing these huge lasers. And you can almost feel the heat coming off these lasers as it slams into a smaller spaceship. You have to like kind of demonstrate and visually what you're seeing. Not You can't say we're in deep space. And then suddenly a spaceship comes roaring overhead. And then another spaceship is chasing it. And this is the, this is the rebels. And this is the empire. You really have to, you yeah, have to go. Yeah, for the, yeah. You really have to like it's set like a, a scene, you know? It's one, yeah, I, I've heard something similar from a couple of people. I won't, I won't mention any names, but I have heard that where it does kind of kill your vibe. You spend like three, four months. Oh yeah, getting ready for this thing, and you're kind of yeah, maybe even a little bit behind the scenes, going like, I think this might be, this might really be something, and then yeah, you get the blank stare. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And um. Oh, absolutely. You or the worst thing is um. For about a year and a half, of my partner and I were doing. Um, are you familiar with the game Double Dragon? Yep. We're doing Double Dragon as a series. Right? Oh wow! Yeah, my friend and I had this uh, friend had the rights, and, we, and I, I worked with this really great take. And and uh, <laughs> I was pitching my one of my agents at the time. And the thing is, when when they, when you pitch, they have these buck slips in front of them, and a buck slip is like a it's like the size of an envelope closed, but it has like the logo comp- the company's logo on the top of it. It's a little piece. It's a scrap piece of paper that can keep notes on. Mm-hmm. If, if you start pitching the story, I remember pitching specifically Double Dragon. My agent just going between his buck slip and writing stuff. I'm like, oh man, he's just going to give all of these notes. Like whatever I'm saying is all wrong. So you have to kind of push through that stuff. You have to read the realm, you know. In this in this in this specific instance, when I was pitching, uh, we actually set that up at YouTube Red, um, incidentally, and kind of fell apart um it was too bad because it was actually i think the precursor to cobra kai i think it kind of put them in the mindset of doing a 
kung fu because we were going to do our, our 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 take was kind of a double dragon meets stranger things oh did, uh, was this like a recent like oh recent yeah it was a two a couple years ago yeah. really yeah because i know yeah. double i think double dragon is still a thing it is um, they just did they just did they a, came they did out a, a ps4 flash. yeah yeah yeah, um, Double Dragon yeah. Four, maybe or Five. And I, and I worked on the movie. That's the funny thing. I worked on the movie. Oh yeah, I have a, I have a, screen, I have a credit in the special effects department on the movie. I I worked three days on the movie, and I I lugged Vista Vision cameras up uh, a railroad bridge so they could shoot plates, so they could later do matte paintings. And so I have a, I have a credit in the movie. That would have come full circle if that had worked. Yeah, out. that's right. a pity. Yeah. That's a pity. Actually, no, it's going to be showrunner on this show, and so it's 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 too bad it didn't work out. But you know when you when you Hollywood is writing scripts is only a small portion of what you do. The rest of it's relationships and it's like pitching and it's being able to communicate with folks and it's not wasting people's time. Cause people, one thing, the, the worst action in the world is wasting someone's time. And I tell you something, if your pitch isn't landing, you're wasting their time and they have more pitches to hear that day. Mm-hmm. So they'll just move on. And, and I don't take it personally anymore. It used to throw me off big time. Well, it still throws me off, but I just don't take it personally. Yeah. Whenever I get the opportunity to pitch on a project, I'm always very happy because um, I'm always thinking, well, it's just my it's my gig to have. I just got to get the right pitch together. And, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And a lot of times is that is that kind of like, does some of that stuff come through networking and stuff? Like how did your, like the relationship with Twisted Pictures and stuff? That was, uh, that was the all relationship. That was, um, that's a really, it's a really interesting, and I'll try to keep this brief, but that's, it's, the, the, with Saul was such a huge chapter in my life. It was a seven year chapter in my life. Um, you know, I, I think I mentioned in 04, I was doing creator uh, at Mostel Lieberman, who Jonathan Mostel had directed U5, U571 and Terminator 3, I think he did that one. And we were, we were doing this movie called uh, Creator, and, um, I had signed with, um, Evolution Management. Stephen Gage was my manager, who I love dearly. We parted ways, but I love him dearly. I still do. Uh, and it was it had been. I think when did Saw come out? Oh six, right? Oh no, no, no. Oh, five, or four, something uh, like that. Saw, saw one. Saw was oh four, I think. Yeah, so it's around there. So uh, I'm writing this movie, and um, I had written. That's right, because oh six, and then uh, so twisted. Twisted gets launched, so they finish. They, Greg Hoffman, bless him, God keep him, uh, passed away uh, years ago. Brilliant, great, fantastic dude. Um, he's the one that brought Saw into Orin and Mark. And they, at the point, at, when I signed with uh, Evolution, they were in a little house on Sunset Boulevard. There wasn't a house. It was it's a, it's a building, but it looks like a house. It was very small. It was very cramped. I remember Gates, uh, Stephen Gates' assistant was in the same office as he was and her, her desk was the cooler they kept all the drinks in so like they were just piled in on each other mm-hmm. but they had yet to break um, Mark had done Bull Durham and um, like, a, like a ton of movies like a ton of movies I'm only, I'm only remembering Bull Durham at the moment but um, The Toy Soldiers is another one and they had formed this company and they had a partner Stephen Fenton who had just left the company so I went in an interview with Gates because a friend of mine had uh, said uh, you should meet with this cat because he writes. I had written Blood of Legend, I'd written Dusted, and I'd written Dominion. So I met with him, and I remember Oren Cool is coming up to him. Goes, "Your name's Tom Fenton." I said, "Yeah." He goes, "We don't need more Fentons here," and he just walked away. I'm like, "Who's that?" He goes, "He's the guy who owns the company." Wow. I said, okay, well, it was nice to meet you guys. I moved on, but no, they ended up signing me, and so I, I'm, I'm working away and saw. Um, they had bought a new building. The guys had decided to buy, as I understand it, they bought a building on Highland Avenue, huge building that they bought for the company. It's brand new or they were redoing it. They put that building up to for a million dollars loan to make saw. And the thought was they shot at Lacey studios for, I want to say 18 days or something like really low. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that it was a video release only. Here's something that a lot of people don't know that saw was shopped around town and my friend Brian Pascal, who was at Universal, tried to buy it, the script, but he couldn't buy it because Lee was attached to write or be in it, and James had to direct it, and and that was a non-starter for those guys. The only guys, who, the only guy who thought it was worthwhile was Greg Hoffman. Greg Hoffman's office was Oren's couch in his coffee table in his office. They were, again, they're stacked on each other. These guys collect this million dollar loan. They shoot this movie in eighteen days at Lacey Studios or something like that. Tobin Bell lays on the ground there for nine days. With that blood, 
pool changing constantly. And um, I remember going to the premiere and, uh, <laughs> and no one saw that ending coming. Right. We're, we're at Man's Chinese Theater and one of the subs, not the big theater, but the smaller ones. And we're all just aghast. It's a friend. It's a crew and a friend. And it's a crew friend screening. It's not open to the public. I'm stunned by it. I'd heard about Saw. I went to a set visit. I wasn't very impressed. And the bathroom I thought was interesting. And it was a little interesting. No, the bathroom, by the way, there's not one real tile in that bathroom. That's all marker, by the way. Oh, really? It's all hand-drawn marker on whiteboard. That's so strange. That, that's amazing. That's wow. a, I still think that's cool. To this wow. day, I think that's cool. Um, so I remember this, this. I remember this. The movie ends. We're all cheering. Greg gets up with the microphone. He holds up Peter Block's Amex card. Peter Block was uh, is Jason Constantine to Peter Block at um, God Lionsgate. He goes, "I got their Mastercard. I got their American Express, man. Let's go have a party." Because there wasn't a rap party planned, but this was it. It was an impromptu rap party. We all went out. We went out and did that weekend did eighteen million dollars and became this juggernaut. Saw. It's been so bizarre to, to kind of so, so, to see that. Yeah, so now I'm like, hey man, I I I I'm, I write stuff like this. You know, I could I could write this these movies, but I had um, they had pulled me into the office and they said this is while they were doing Saw Two. I'd read I'd read the script for Saw Two. It was called the the Desperate that Bowsman had written, and they adjusted it to make it a Saw movie because they turned it around really fast because there wasn't an idea to do a Saw movie for eight years in a row. I saw too. They just thought that she, they should capitalize on next October. Yeah. So let's just go. Yeah. What do we have laying around that we could do? And so um, I read that script and I gave some notes on it. And they said we have this idea we want to do for six 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 is coming up as January from you know that that date's coming up. And and I had this spec called Prodigal Son. Uh, it was about a uh, a freelance exorcist that's the ass but doesn't know it. Okay. And uh, they said, uh, can you adjust that? Because we're gonna go, we're gonna we're gonna release this on six six six, and you know Joaquin Phoenix was involved, if I remember correctly. And um, I rewrote this thing really fast and well, I think, because they set it up. We set it up at Beacon, which is a Disney company. If I again, this is years ago, uh, and then things are going great. Saw two comes out, it does really well. I went to the premiere for that, had a ball. Um. And then it was like the week later, I get a call from Greg Hoffman saying, I have disturbing news. They're going to remake The Omen. So they're going to take our date. So we're going to drop the project. I said, oh, man, it sucks. I was really disappointed. But he said, you know, come in because I know you have ideas for Saw 3. Let's talk about Saw 3. And I said, great. And this was on, and I, I went in. That was Tuesday night, I think. I went in Thursday because the office was right. I, I lived in Hollywood at the time. I lived on this little street called the Long Prix right off Hollywood Boulevard. So. I lived within a quarter mile of the office. So I was always in the office for a few reasons. One, uh, free food. I they always had stuff I could eat because I was broke, dead broke. They had caught, they had, I remember they had a Starbucks machine, man. I was like, I would just oh, go just, in there and visit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Walk out with the gacked out on coffee. And so that was on Tuesday. So Thursday I go in, I go in for some more business. I go in for a prodigal. No, it wasn't prodigal son cause it had folded by then, but there was some more talk about, there was another movie that I was going to do there and, and I said to Greg, I said, um, yeah, man, I'll come in Monday. We'll talk Saw 3. He goes, yeah, okay, great. Looking forward to it. And uh, Monday comes around, and my Gates calls me. My manager calls me and goes, uh, Greg Hoffman died. I go, well, how, what are you talking about? Greg Hoffman died. Greg Hoffman's 42 years old. How did he die? And he said, he, you know, he died. And I was shocked. And at the time, my father had passed two or three years before. I had gotten a divorce in the meantime, so I'd never gotten to mourn. Like, you know, properly mourn that, mm-hmm. like those kind of losses. So Greg Hoffman, who was the nicest dude who treated me with a lot of respect. I was just starting off. I didn't have any credit. I had nothing going on, but he was very kind to me. I, I actually mentioned this in the book where he, the Prodigal Son, I think, yeah, where he write, he wrote on that script that this is the worst script. This is the worst scene I've ever read. And I have that script. It's sitting right there. Because I never want to get that note again. But from coming from him, it was like the night because I know he, I know he meant it because I know he read it, you know. Yeah, yeah. And and ultimately, uh, it was it was the worst funeral I've ever been to. It was packed. I remember giving trying to give Shawnee Smith my chair. She was nine months pregnant. She was probably eleven months pregnant by then. She was super young as well. 
right? Huh? Greg was like super young. Oh, at the great. Time. He's like, I think he was in his 40s. 40. You know, really young. He had just made it. I just, I'm telling you, man, you know, you hear this a lot like, oh, what a, what a good guy. I'm telling you, man, this guy was a good, good, good man. And um, it's rare in this business when you meet somebody who, mm-hmm is honest with you. I mean, I have been told to my face, oh man, we get you. Yeah. You're, you're the guy you're doing the movie. Never hear anything from those guys again. You know, you'll, and that happened on saw. It would happen later in, on saw and a few other projects, but you know, Greg Hoffman wasn't that guy. And, um, and so ultimately, um, it, uh, about a month goes by and I get a call from Oren, Oren Coolis. These guys by now, by now are flush with money. They're making tons of money because they've got the saw threes is queued up. And they, he calls me in his office, and I think he had just bought his hockey team at the time. And his, he was famous for saying, hockey teams are great when you buy them because they, they turn billionaires into millionaires. <laughs> and uh, he, he, he goes, Fentoni. He, go, he goes, Fentoni, because he never called me Fenton because he didn't like the, other, the partner that left him. Fentoni, uh, we need you to do Saw 3, and we need you to do Saw 4 and Saw 5. And so you need to get to work. Wow. Just like and, that. Um, just like that, yeah. And this was off of Prodigal Son because Prodigal Son had picked up speed so fast. And, and that was a gothic horror movie. You know, that was big. That was the end of the world. Like, this is the Prodigal Son was the, the eve of the guy's birthday. I can't remember what birthday it was, but he was about to turn into the Antichrist. He had to pick between a female uh, uh, loving a human or becoming this anti God and stuff. And it's like, this is huge, you know, biblical end of the world thing. You know, cities were being destroyed and stuff. And I was like, no, but your, your, your sense of style is right there. And Jane, uh, I think Lee must have read the script and thought it was pretty good. And they and, and Lee was off doing uh, Dead Silence. James was doing Death Warrant. And Lee was, and Bowsman was off doing something else. I'm not sure. And um, I was stunned. So I get to I get to write the next three Saw movies. So I sit down and. And, he, and, and this is always the word my my stories go askew because at the time uh, I had I had success was coming really easy like I was just getting these gigs left and right and stuff and I could do no wrong so I started probably drinking a little bit too much and probably doing some other things some other powders I shouldn't have been doing with you know because I'm but before I know it I'm I'm uh, like literally uh, I went from having stealing coffee from the office to. Oh, you're the guy now. So that's like a lot of money. Yeah, and I guess it's probably a lot to take on as well. I mean, it was. Yeah, it, I know it that was. was probably it's the goal. But when you get it, yeah. I can imagine it's well, a it crazy experience. It was a lot of pressure. And uh, now, what happened was with three was I, I submitted some treatments and uh, traps and the whole nine because I was a big believer in world building. Mm-hmm. And I thought Saw deserved uh, that kind of treatment, and um, I'd heard that. James is now, no, Lee is now free. Lee's going to work with you. And I said, so I find if I knew exactly what that meant, that means that he was going to write the script. And I wasn't, ultimately that's what happened. And, and I'll say this uh, on the record. I've said this a few times that my saw three was not the one they should have done. It wasn't, it was wrong. And, and, and the one they ended up doing with the girl and the, and, and, um, I can't remember, I can't remember the actor's name, but the one they did was right where Jigsaw dies, you know? Yep. Yep. They did that. That was, that was the good one. That, that's what they should have done. And um, mine was the cor- incorrect take because it didn't finish their trilogy. I was ready. To, mine was loosely based on adding to the jigsaw mythos and stuff. I won't go into because I might want to use it someday. And um, um, so then ultimately uh, that comes out and I'm like kind of, you know, I, I can say it now that I, I just lost uh, the gig went away. But at the time, it was kind of a sh- kick in the face. Support First Class Horror on Patreon for as little as $1. Can't get enough of the horror? Carve yourself a deal from official merchandise only on Teespring. Join us on all social media at First Class Horror. We have such sights to show you. Do I hear about four, or am I just talking too much about yeah, Saw? Yeah, no, no, of course. I, I'm actually kind okay. of interested now because three kind of falls apart. Yeah, three falls apart, and um, and like, did you feel uh, like were you still in talks to do four at this point, or did you kind of feel no, like, no, nah, fuck this, I'm just going to walk away from this? Well, you know, how, you know how they worked is um, this is how those dudes worked. Um, uh, by October, uh, the movie come out on the 28th, right around uh, the give or take Halloween. 
And, and it was such a big – Saw was so big back then that mm-hmm. even the even the Rob Zombie remake of Halloween couldn't open up on Halloween. Like they couldn't even yeah. – nobody could touch that date. Yeah. So I'm looking over my poster. I've got hung on my wall. Okay. Yeah, the 26th. Saw 4 came out on the 26th. I've got all this stuff on our office. Which is like perfect. Yeah, you, know, you 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 bleed out. You bleed. You, you know, Hemingway said writing is easy. All you do is sit, sit at the typewriter and bleed, and that's what I did for these movies that are on my wall here. And um, uh, um, so so you you start in the next Saw movie uh, on the week of the twentieth because you you're able to see a, a, a rough cut, uh, maybe not a, maybe a week or two before and before they lock it before it gets released. They want to get it started because no plan. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They didn't at the time. They might have. They, uh, Marcus and uh, Patrick might have come up with something later, but there was no plan at the time. So they said, "What would you do?" And so when the four, when four comes along, my agent calls me, and he knows I was really still PO'd about what happened on three. And he goes, "Listen, man, I know you don't want to do saw, but um, it's going to happen. If you want, you can have it." And I said, "Yeah, but what's the caveat? There's some kind of bullshit caveat. There's always a caveat with, you, with those guys." And it wasn't it's not a bullshit caveat. They, what they did was they did a bake off. They they hired three. They bought three scripts. They bought mine. They bought um, Marcus and Bad. They bought some dude in Toronto. I don't know that dude's name. Right. And those and and out of those three, whichever batch was going to win, you still get paid, but you don't get your name in the post. You don't get profit sharing. You don't get like you know uh, not profit sharing. It's like a pool of money. You don't get. You don't you don't do as well. Okay. So. Uh, a little side note, I talked about drinking too much. By now, I'm drinking way too much. And now I'm drinking and doing way too much powder because now I'm at Hollywood parties all the time, hanging out with my idols. Um, dudes you know, dudes I knew, dudes I watched, guys I love, girls I loved, and doing way too much as I sniff. Uh, <laughs> way too much of everything. Uh, you know, up till four or five in the morning, you know. You know, just going crazy. But this opportunity comes along, so I jump at it, and now I feel super pressured because I'm just one guy. And I know, and I know Patrick and Marcus because those guys were on a show called um, Greenlight with Damon and um, Matt Damon and uh, who's, who's, who's Matt Damon's partner, Ben Affleck. Yep. They had a show called Project Greenlight, which they, they those guys had done Feast, and so those cats because I met them out. I'm, I was at a bar. I was at Bronson Bar, which is this really great bar I used to go to. And I'm like, hey, man, I know you guys, man. Um, I watched your show. I'm cheering for you guys because I love you guys. He goes, and Marcus goes, I'll never forget this. Marcus goes, are you you Tom Fenton? I go, yeah. He goes, are you, do you go by Thomas Fenton when you write stuff? I go, yeah, I do. He goes, did you write Red, the werewolf movie I did for Katie mm-hmm. that never got made? I go, yeah, I did. He goes, you know, Weinstein gave us that script, man. He said it was like one of the best scripts he's ever read. This is Harry wow. Weinstein before Harry Weinstein became, you know, the Weinstein's ran dimension. Right, Bob and Harvey. Yeah. And I go, I go, wait a minute. The wine scenes are giving you my script to tell you it's one of the best scripts I've ever read and they haven't made it. Yeah, man. I'm like, <laughs> that's bullshit. Like that, <laughs> that shouldn't be a thing. If you've read the script, you should want to make it anyway. It's kind of a it's kind of a weird way to meet these guys. But I was friends with them. But when four comes along, there's and there's no they send us they send us all these they don't send us any DVDs. They send us these encrypted emails and stuff. This is so oh, I don't know what year it is now. It's all some, whatever. The internet is not a thing yet. It's kind of, an, it's like AOL still a thing, I think, yeah. or maybe it's, there's no direction. Like, well, just do, just do whatever you think is right. You know, so this is a problem. So this is coming off the no, back end of tree. It's just kind yeah, of tree. like, oh, yeah. well, just do it. We've seen it. You saw him die mm-hmm. or did he die? What's on that tape? That was the big question. What's on the tape? And, um, I th- I knew it was on the tape, and I said, and my idea, uh, and this was this got to be a big point of content, bone of contention. Do you remember that? Do you remember how he eats the tape at three and the yep. three? Yep. He swallows that wax, wax tape. Mm-hmm. I thought, wouldn't it be great if if um, we don't reveal this till like the mid first act? And like, because Hoffman was a character, by the way, that was baked into those scripts because it was a it was a nod to John uh, to oh God, John, John to Greg because uh, we, we all wanted Hoffman to be the F you to the audience, because here's the guy who's been investigating, uh, jigsaw, but he's actually the real, mm-hmm. he's the real guy. So my idea, uh, with that was that he find you know, there's this big interplay about how he has to get to the body. Cause the body was, there wasn't that old, I later would write that autopsy scene that's in the movie, but 
it wasn't it didn't open up like that. It opened up with um. Oh, I think there's it's in the back of the book. In the back of the book, there's my my cold open for software. But he gets the body. He opens up the body. He gets the tape. He puts a tape in, and he presses play, and you hear, "Hello, John. I want to play a game." Right. So what you re- what you realize is that John Kramer was also playing a game. That's I like that. There's someone deeper, deeper than Jigsaw. The Jigsaw was just the first layer mm-hmm. of this. And um, I thought that was a very natural way to go because now we talk because he's dead. So now we can meet we can meet the the guy that the, his sponsor, the guy that's been pulling his strings. Mm-hmm. And now we got a whole other franchise going. Basically, yeah, because that's kind of like uh, I don't want to call it rebooting, but you, you yeah. kind of you can just restart and it feels yeah. fresh. And it's and it's and it's organic to what's already been laid down because even when they shot that, um, what's a good microphone? I'm not paying, bro. <laughs> Or water. Just to put that out there. Just you never know. You never know. When when they shot that, like they would do this really interesting thing. They shot um, they shot a scene with Shawnee killing Eric Matthews, um, because they said Eric Matthews is alive if you want him. He's dead if you want him. Uh, but Johnny Wahlberg wasn't available. I remember this. They're like well, we shot this thing where Shawnee kills him, and then Jigsaw's going to kill her for ki- just outright killing Johnny Wahlberg, Eric Matthews. Mm-hmm. So he's alive if you want him, but then uh, he's dead. And then, then, then they said, you know, we got him for like a day. He'll come in for a day. What can we do for a day? And I think it was those guys that came up with the whole news thing. Uh, I remember trying to put spikes and stuff in the ice, and they thought that was too far. How did you not freak out when things were being chopped and changed, and there was no real, no real? You, you just you drink more. You drink more <laughs> liquor is what you do. You drink more whiskey. And um, you, you stay fluid. And unfortunately, what happened there was um, I had this philosophy back then, which is whatever it takes to get the thing written. And so, like, you know, I, I was basically flirting with it and it would later become a full blown alcoholic. And I've been I've been in recovery now for 12 years for that. Oh, congratulations. Thank you very much. Because, because this, this town will rip you apart, man, because it's it's um, there's all this dough on the line. Your career is on the line because this is a this is a juggernaut series. Um you, I had a script. Uh, I had a script called Jericho Hill, which would later be set up at four five one. But it was that was also I was getting ready to direct that and stuff. And so you literally are trying to uh, not go insane, but stay creative, mm-hmm. right? But you need that insanity. So um, when four happened, um, I, it gets really murky for me because like that's when my using kind of like took off, and then if that's why the chain letter. If you've ever seen Chain Letter, now you know why. <laughs> Chain Letter was an experience because my my draft was really good. That, that was my, something my, I was going to bring up, but I yeah, don't feel like uh, going down uh, that. No, we can wait for that if you want. Um, yeah, I, I don't. It's up to you. you. It's your show. But um, ultimately, uh, with um, Saw, uh, when it, when Four came out, it was. Um, I, I thought it was cool. You know, I was. You know, but but I was not welcome back on five. And the reason why I think there's a couple of reasons why. One, I think there was because uh, this is another thing going back to Hollywood. I was told by a producer who I won't say who well, what it was, but he brought me in his office. And he said, look, you're taking over again because we're done with Marcus and Patrick. You're going to do the next three. The next three Everybody. movies. Next three movies. Yeah. Again, for the second time. I said, great. Love it. Can't wait. Because I, because Lee Wanell had said that I write closest to his, um, mm-hmm. the way he writes. Like I can mimic the way he writes. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, I was doing this. I was, Blood of Legend was getting traction. There's a pretty, there's a, there's a director attached, big time director, and he goes, because man, he's an English cat. He said, uh, "Saw that's like a stopgap for you, right? Because you don't write like that. You write like these big epic things, don't you?" It's like, well, I love Saw. Saw is cool. Saw is like, Saw is the devil in the basement. You know, I also write about angels in heaven, but I like to like I can do them both fairly, fairly well because I, I enjoyed working on Saw. Saw was a lot of fun, brutal. And there was at the time, I'll tell you something. This is a little secret. Uh, at the time, there was something called House of Jigsaw. It might still be up. It's a website. Mm-hmm. I've heard of it. Yeah, yeah. And the producers would tell us to mine that for ideas, uh, for traps. All right. Okay. 
And um, I didn't do that because I just used the Renaissance, or not the Renaissance, the Inquisition, pardon me, the Inquisition is, is my trap generator, you know. And um, ah, Nice. I, I like that idea, actually. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Because that was something was, I was going to ask, like, where does, well, at least for you, I know you can't speak for anybody else, but like some some of those traps and death scenes are quite... Um, Quite elaborate. I know now, probably in modern day, people are like, oh yeah, you know the, the thing from from Saw. But yeah. I think at the time yeah. it was quite groundbreaking to to constantly be able to come up with inventive ways. Well, especially since they they, they buried the lead with the the um, reverse bear trap. Uh, that was like the coolest thing ever, and, mm-hmm. I, and I tried to call that the skull uh, the skull buster for years. And no, 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 it's reverse bear trap. I can't, but skull buster sounds cooler. Yeah, it does. <laughs> like, no, it's reverse. Reverse bear trap, because that was like that is a fantastic that 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 trap alone um, was the best one they ever did. It's the first one they ever did, you know. It splits your jaw open mm-hmm. and sits on your head, you know. Uh, James Wan, those guys are brilliant. There's no and and James Wan's the nicest guy in the world, and Lee's a great guy. I, I know Lee. Well, I've, I've seen him a few times at Shane Black's house and. Uh, hanging out there having barbecues and I, I see him and we're, we're he's, a, he's a he's a nice guy they're very talented guys but james um james uh, reinvented that he, he kind of those guys kind of created that whole subgenre, you know yeah i don't call it torture porn because the saw is not torture porn like hostile torture porn but those guys started that and then um i'll just finish up the saw thing with the last thing i'll i think it was at six i went to the sixth premiere I couldn't go to five because I was ill because I was getting I, was, I had just gotten into recovery and I was not in any position to be seen in public and um, I certainly wasn't going to go to saw premiere and my agent said yeah. oh you're boycotting I said no man I just got I'm get, I got the shakes and I can't you know I can't leave the house yeah, I need to take care of this yeah I need to take care of my, my, my sobriety first and so I get sober so I'm sober for about a year I go to six the premiere for six I don't remember much about it. oh yeah that was the one with the, tur- the I remember that okay not that was the one with the, like, the kids, like the wipeout set where the like, people spun. Remember, they're, they're on like a little kids um, go round. By the way, the morning lawn outside. I don't know if you can hear that. Is that yeah, bothering you? Uh, no, it's fine. It's fine. Okay, because I can't do anything about it. Because <laughs> they'll hurt me, those dudes. They're, they're big. Um, anyway, so I finished six, and I had struck a deal to write nine or six, seven, eight. I must have, I must have struck a deal to write eight because they call me. They go, "You want to write eight? Because those guys, Marcus and Patrick are done. They've got seven to do, and then we're going to do an eight. And I go, fine. And they go, you're going to write it with Tobin Bell. Great. Oh, wow. I, I love Tobin. So I'm at the – and the reason why I remember six so well is because I met Toby Hooper that night at the, at the fucking rap party. And Poltergeist is, as you know, you've read the book, mm-hmm. is one of my favorite movies of all time. And he was there with, um, and, and, and his producer walked up to me and said, you, you know, we're doing the Chainsaw movies again, and we want you involved in that because we, we, the, the last ones, the Nest Bell ones, were a little bit too pretty. And so he said, go, the basement was too big, is what he said. And I go, yeah, sure, man, I'm around, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm here. Yes, I Ultimately, I'm, we met, Tobin and I met, we hashed out a really great idea. He had an idea about how to bring John Kramer back. I don't want to say what it was because it's his idea. But it was very cool. Made sense in the Saw world, in the Saw universe. Just because you're dead doesn't mean you're dead, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, it means that you're just being played a trick on. And, and it made sense because I, I always thought to myself, well, if we met the guy and he was dead when we met him, why can't we? Meet, why can't he be dead and he'd still be alive? You know, this Saw had that kind of yeah uh, flexibility to it. And uh, so I went to Malibu and I met with Tobin a few times, and we just for like six or seven hours at a go and wrote this story. Ultimately, what happened with that was, and that was like a done deal. Again, it was like a, money was agreed on and shares were agreed on. It was a video game. It was also being made off this. And then what happens? Paranormal activity happens. And paranormal activity destroys the high budget $10 million horror movies. So much so that Paramount, that I'm officing out of at, the mo- at that time, I think it was at Paramount, because Robert Evans had given me an office there. Um, they had launched Paramount Vantage, or in, there was a hundred thousand dollar version of the Paramount lot. I can't. Remember, it wasn't Vantage. Um, forget the name of it. But they all had these like labels, like Fox Atomic mm-hmm. wasn't yeah. Fox. It was Fox Atomic. And uh, oh, I had something to say about that. 
Oh, I can't remember. Uh, so, so, oh, oh no, this is my funny story. Here's, here's how I got, this is so, so they cancel the movie. So I'm at Shane's, Shane Black's house. There's a party in him. I bump into my, my, I bump into Max Landis. And he goes, hey, man, he goes, sorry about what happened in the movie. I said, yeah, I know it's a drag. He goes, yo, Oren Perel, Oren, I think his name is Oren Perel. Is that how you say his okay, name? Oren Pelly. Yeah, per, thank you, thank you. Sorry that. He's over there. You want to meet him? He says, yeah, I'd love to meet him. So I, Max walks from him and goes, Oren, this is Tom. This is soft, Tom. I go, hey, man. I go, you owe me $150,000. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Max is like, geez, Tom, I didn't think you were going to say something stupid like that. I was like, well, trust me, man. Trust me. Uh, if there's anything to be stupid to be said. Of course, it was a big joke. Yeah, but I mean, and I love paranormal activity. I thought, I thought they did a great job. I mean, anybody that can reinvent the found footage medium after Blair Witch kind of yeah, like. Yeah, true. And, and that kind you know. of, I, I'm not sure, I, I, I can only imagine it was the same everywhere, but I even remember here in Ireland where the market is probably not as huge overall, but yeah. like Saw and Paranormal Activity, and there's probably maybe a handful of others that I can remember becoming like the October Halloween, mm, this is yeah. what everybody's doing, whether you like our movies, whether you don't. This is what you're doing this October. Was Saw big in Ireland? Yeah, huge. Was huge, it really? huge, huge, it was, huge. I guess it was big. I know it was big in Japan. Because uh, I remember. Yeah, I never knew. I never knew like that. And I know the Germans liked it. And I guess I, get, I'm, I guess I'm glad to hear that Ireland liked it. I mean, yeah, like it, it was one of those things where uh, maybe maybe now it's a little bit different. But at the time, there was a lot of movies that came out that we didn't actually get. But yeah. Saw was always one that was like super super well promoted and you know we have a, a I think it's an 8 screen movie theater here and mm-hmm. I, I want to say it was like 4 or 6 screens for like the first 2 weeks maybe really? Really? Just so, like, so the same movie on 4 or 5 or yeah, five or yeah. Six of the eight all screen. different shows and then like obviously when they start wow. bringing out the 3D movies you had like 2 3D screens and an IMAX screen and a yeah yeah, it was crazy. That's cool. I didn't. I didn't know that. I, you because you, you, you know the thing is when you're in L.A. it's just such a bottle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But they 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 um they cast a moratorium on mega graphics in L.A. But before they would so there's no like they had a limited amount of billboards because when Saw would come out it'd be 3200 screens and L.A. would be plastered with Saw stuff. Plastered. Mm-hmm. You couldn't. Uh, my uh, my. <laughs> I laugh about it now because it's kind of stupid, but uh, by by the time Saw 4 came out, my, my, my personal relationships had gone in the tubes, and this girl had walked out because I was a very toxic individual. And she, she I, 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 I sat down to have lunch with her one day over here. She goes, that's Saw posters everywhere. <laughs> and I said, I said, yeah, I'm just trying to, you know, trying to work my magic, you know, because she couldn't escape it. Because, I mean, these things on buses, on, on billboards, on birds. I mean, they were, they were sky it writing. Like, yeah. it, was, it was everywhere, especially in L.A., so I have a huge affection for Saw. It was a great part of my life. And I always, uh, um, when I heard there were, Chris Rock was doing Spiral, I thought that was pretty cool. And, and I look forward to seeing that movie. Would you, ever, cool. would you ever get involved again? Or would you like to? Or is that kind of close the book? I think I close the book on that one. Yeah. Yeah, I think I want to do other things. The 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 thing that actually interests me now in this movie that I'm doing now is, is a spiritual horror movie. So it's all about um, you know ghosts and stuff. It, I find that... Because I, I, I find the I find the temperament of the United States at the moment very brutal to each other, and I don't think um, I'm not interested in writing brutal stuff. I've written it, you know, with I Spit on Your Grave and stuff. I've, I've written my fair share of that stuff, but it was when it was a novelty. Yeah. yeah. Now, when it's happening during a presidential debate, debate, you know, so I'm, my mood has changed a bit. Um, there was something I wanted to ask you about. Was the uh, the I, I'm a, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly or not. Is it the Myrtle Plantation? Yeah, the Myrtles. Myrtles. Yeah, you, yeah that's. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was. I just wanted to ask about that. Um, I had read some stuff online, but I didn't really want to. I just wanted to ask you, how did you become involved with that? Or that was uh, that was in, that was during this time period that uh, I did just finished uh, writing for. And uh, I forgot his name. One of the producers at uh, one of the producers of Saw, not not Mark or Orm. Um, oh man, I got the name is slipping my brain at the moment. Really nice guy, I love him. He was producing this movie called uh, The Plantation, and he he saw me out one night and he said, "I have this book I want you to read," and I did. And it's basically 
this this the, the Merle's plantation. I say this with a big smile. Is haunted, man. It is haunted. Yeah. It is absolutely haunted, and I define haunted by supernatural occurrences. Be they ghosts, I don't know, but. Uh, are, you, are you normally a, a supernatural kind of paranormal guy? I am. I am open to the, at the, at the and I'm much more uh, uh, spiritually aware now because I'm, I'm much more at peace with myself, quite frankly. So I realize there's something out there that I don't quite understand. But at the time, uh, this was uh, at the height of my uh, drinking and stuff. So I, I actually um, I, I stayed sober for like gigs, but then once. I think it, was, it started at five o'clock. I started drinking. Then it was four o'clock, three o'clock, two o'clock. Then it was like one o'clock. I started drinking. But this thing, I was clean because I, I had to go to Louisiana with the producers who sent me. And because what, what this is, is uh, in a nutshell, the Merle's plantation is a small plantation uh, left over from our Civil War, um, built by slaves, um, slave works workers. And I don't know the n- date, but the legend has it that a there were two types of slaves back then. You had field slaves and house slaves. A field slave would spend all day toiling in the fields, picking cotton or chopping wood or doing something in the elements and wouldn't last as long. Quite frankly, it would die much sooner than a house slave who is not out in the field sweating constantly and getting hit with axes and stuff. And so being a, being a house slave was the, um, was preferable. And, um, there was a woman <clears throat> named Chloe. So the legend goes who, was having a, was the master, I forget the guy's name, he was a general, I believe, who built the house, who wanted this woman as a, a concubine against the wife's wishes. He would always sleep with these slaves. The wife finds out about it and is going to cast her into the fields. I think maybe she was eavesdropping one night. I think she even got her ear cut off, according to legend. But then she was going to be cast into the fields to work. And that was like a death sentence. So to prove her validity to the family, <clears throat> she made a birthday cake that night. And she slipped into the birthday cake, something called oleander. Oleander is a natural um, plant around that area uh, that's used for medicinal purposes. But if you use too much of it, uh, it can kill you. And she used too much of it. And so she killed these two little girls. And I think, the, I think maybe even the wife. And when the general found out about it, or the homeowner found out about it, um, he cast her into the slaves. And the slaves, fearing retribution, murdered her, cut her up into pieces, and threw her into the Mississippi River. Jesus. And and by by the way, that's the primary story. But there are literally, because when I read the book, there are so many ghosts there. It read like Disney's Haunted Castle. Like it was like, I, there was supposed to be an Indian that mm-hmm. sits in a canoe or something, and there's supposed to be a bunch of soldiers that show up because at one point it was a field hospital for the war, the first Civil War. Uh, hopefully the only Civil War we're going to have. But um, um, it had lots and lots of of uh, 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 of history. And I thought, well, this is interesting. It's a paycheck once. First off, it's not... It's it's more in line with what I want to do, which is horror, scary stuff. I thought maybe it could be like a shining take where because they end up the, the story is about <clears throat> this woman in the eighties flipping this place into a bed and breakfast, which it is today. It's a bed and breakfast. Yeah, so I, I, I actually like shining, yeah, I looked up a, a small bit yeah. about it and I seen that it's it's currently a bed and breakfast. And yeah, so I thought it's well, booked out uh, an awful yeah, lot months it, in advance. I, it, and I tell you why it is because it's 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 not what you think it is because I, I I'm I was very skeptical because this this I saw the website and I thought this is a so it's a bed and breakfast but it's haunted and come experience our ghosts I'm thinking oh there's gonna be wires and speakers and it's gonna be some junky mm-hmm. BS you know my take for the movie was kind of a, a Jack Torrance thing where they go to they go they get isolated and start flipping this house and and basically the husband goes crazy and stuff mm-hmm. and uh, and 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 uh, Lots of sex with ghosts and stuff. Very interesting, weird stuff. And um, so the producers and I fly to Louisiana. We get these rums. And um, and what's interesting, they closed. It's a big house. The middle of it's closed off to the day, but the the wings are left open where you, where you, where you sleep. And I walked in very skeptical. Like, this is baloney. And so we sit in the back court, porch, and there is – and I have plenty of pictures of this stuff, too um, – I'm sitting there with the two producers, and we have this pact 
I go, you guys got to promise me you're not because they're from that area. They knew because they, they went to like high school in that that part of the world. Mm-hmm. I said, you guys cannot fake anything. You have to no 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 planting or anything like this because I really want to see what's going on here for with this movie. And we made a friend there. Some other cat was standing there. Some some younger guy, and he was a nice guy. And we're hanging out there. And we're all sitting there on the porch talking. And, 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 and what's interesting about this big house, next to it's a smaller house. And the small house used to hold the kitchen because th- these kitchens were very large. And they were, using fi- they were using firewood and stuff back then. And they didn't want the kitchen in the house in case the house was to burn down. The, the kitchen just burns down, not the house. So now it's a, now it's a, um, it's a freaking uh, souvenir store. So I'm sitting in the back. And I got, I'm in this rocking chair. It's like midnight. It's, it's Louisiana, man, and it's muggy, you know? And I'm hearing this voice coming from the right side of me in, uh, in this space. You're outside right. at this point? I, we're outside. Okay. And, I'm, and, I, and then I hear something clunking around in the, in the building over there. And these guys are just gabbing away. I'm like, hey, man. One of these guys, by the way, did the soundtrack to Saw. Like he ran a record company, whatever. And I go, I go, hey man, you guys hear this voice and this clunking around? He goes, oh, yeah, it's just Cleo, man. Just be cool. She'll come out. Be cool. And so you could hear this. You could hear. I'm telling you, you could hear a voice talking, but you couldn't make out the words. It wasn't like it was. It wasn't whispering, but it was something else. And then something is banging around, <laughs> moving stuff in the kitchen because that's where Cleo supposedly. Inhibit inhabits. And what's really interesting is that the legend goes like this: that Cleo is a protective spirit. So if your if your covers are off, you'll find them on you because Cleo will have tucked you in at night. Jesus. Nice. So so here I am. I'm in this house. By the way, by the way, the whole house is crooked because evidently the slaves didn't have a right angle. So the whole house is kind of cantered because it's really old. Mm-hmm. And I'm terrified. Like I'm like, there's something in this house. And so we all take, we all have these, um, we have these chairs in our rooms and we all face the chairs to the wall. Cause I'm not going to wake up and have something sitting in the chair watching me. Right. And so I, I think it was the first night the, the, the maid shows up, the housekeeping shows up, you know, housekeeping. And I go, yeah, come on in. And she goes, how'd you sleep? I go, I go, I go pretty well, but it was kind of, I was kind of crushed by these covers. She was crushed by the covers. I said, yeah, this is a little heavy. Do you have anything lighter? Because it's freezing there, by the way. They've got this AC cranked. And she goes, no, that wasn't the covers. That was the little girls. And I go, I go what? She Jesus. goes, I go, what? She goes, you're living, you're staying in the nursery where the little the girls died. The little girls climb on the bed with you. Dude, that's giving me, like, goosebumps right now. <laughs> I know. And I go, I go, is this real? And she goes, I would never be caught dead in here after dark. Oh. Uh... But she's a local. So... I can honestly say, and, and I remember there was a TV show that did a bunch of stuff there, and they all, they all came back and said uh, it was haunted. Yeah, I know, like um, uh, Unsolved Mysteries. Uh, yes, yes, uh, yeah. Um, yes. What was the host's name? Uh, Robert Stack. Robert Stack. That, I worked on that show, by the way. Yeah, there's actually a. Oh, really? Mm. That's kind of cool. There's like a gaff around a few episodes of that I like show. That show. Yeah, it's um, a good show. He he has a couple of interviews where he actually talks about that, and he he, he apparently. He was like, no, it, it, this was more than just like a, just an episode in a show. This was like <laughs> yeah, something yeah. else. I think that the, those ghost hunter guys go there and yeah. they say unreservedly it's, it's haunted. Yeah. I mean, I've got tons of show, I've got tons of, of uh, video of orbs. And we're talking like orbs with like energy balls. Like it looks like an, almost like an animated object. Mm-hmm. The, it was absolutely, we went to a graveyard. We went to one graveyard. This is really interesting. And it had a tombstone entrenched inside of a tree. And um, this tree had taken over this tombstone, and it turns out that the tomb, the the the, the tomb had belonged to an overseer, uh, uh, the casket, and the slaves to get retribution throw acorns into the casket, so trees grow through the the remains of these people. Bizarre. But yeah, I, I looked a lot into into um, into. Um, the Myrtle Plantation, and uh, mm-hmm. I, I didn't realize how much like backstory and lore there is, and how much. I know, I know a lot of places kind of say, "Oh, you know, this is haunted, or this it was built on a graveyard." Woo. Um, I don't know. Just <laughs> like everything behind that one seems to be a little bit more serious than normal. Um, uh huh. Yeah. Which is a bit. We actually have a place here in in Wexford. Um, it's Ireland's most haunted 
house or place or whatever. It's called Loftus Hall. Uh-huh. Um, you should look it up sometime. It's like a, okay. this. Well, how do you spell that? How do you spell that? Call it up. L O F T U S Hall. Um, okay. It's actually been sold. So if you've got two. 2.5 million euros. <laughs> you can, you can, around. You can buy it. Um, there was a movie made uh, a couple of years ago by Epic Pictures, uh, The Lodgers. It was mm. made loosely about Loftus Hall, but they actually came over and filmed in in the hall. Um, okay. The, the story was that um, it, it's basically right on the coast. Uh, so ships would come in and people would kind of pass through the house and stay the night and stuff like that. But uh, one night they had a stranger come to the house and they were having some form of party. I think they were playing cards. He's the devil, right? He's the yeah, devil? Yeah, and, yes. they, and they bring yeah, this guy in sorry, and, and Lady Tottenham, the, the wife, uh, she drops her card and when she goes under the table to pick it up, she sees like these kind of like weird yeah. cloven hoof kind of thing. Yes. And then she looks up and he bursts into a ball of flames and shoots to the roof. Yeah. Um, awesome. Yeah. Like I don't know. Like I've done. I've done all the tours. I actually stayed there the night at one point. Um, How was that? How was that? Super creepy. Now, yeah. I think a, a little bit. Some of the tours they do are kind of like what you're talking about. There's like sounds, and it's like, ooh, it's the ghost. Yeah. Um, yeah. But they do one where you can just stay in the house, and they don't okay. do any. There's no sound effects or no anything they just leave you in the house um that's now how old is that house uh, it opened in 1350 so 670 wow. years wow yeah wow. and it's right like out on like a peninsula so uh-huh. you've got one road in and you can see it for miles as you drive down it's just sitting on its own like wow yeah with the with the sea as like the backdrop yeah um but yeah, uh, two two guys bought it a couple of years ago and kind of made it into a, I guess, a kind of a tourist attraction, but they're getting out of the business now and it's been left there. I remember hearing that story and thinking that the uh, uh, the devil made an appearance that, I remember the stormy night and the, and the yep. um, yeah, it's cool. I really think that's a cool story. Yeah, no, cool the, story. The, movie, the movie was okay, but I, I don't think... Like I said, I think it was just loosely based. It was more the hall they wanted and not the story. Right, right. Um, which is kind of a pity because I think that could be made into a really good... Yeah. I I, I would... I, I'd love to come to Ireland and make a movie at some point because um, yeah. I, I love the uh, history. Yeah, there's there's a lot of a lot of history there. I, I actually didn't... Because I think, obviously, growing up here, like a lot of people just think... Uh, pardon my French, but think Ireland is shit. Because there's not much to do, um, and like you kind of, I'll, I'll trade you. You can come and live in where I live, and I'll oh, where you live, and I'll, I'll yeah. take it. Not much to do. I could use a little quiet. A lot of yeah, and and I think the older I get, the kind of more I kind of appreciate. And there is a lot of history, um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of cool ideas, and there hasn't been too many. I don't think Irish are. Well, I was going to ask what, what is what is. So I was surprised to find out that Saul was big in Ireland. Uh, I had never thought about it. But what, what is the uh, what is the Irish temperament for horror? Uh, quite good, but very closet. Um, mm. Very closet. I don't know why. Mm. Um, it's kind of kind of gotten a little bit bigger now. Uh, Dublin, yeah. uh, the capital, is is quite yeah. good. They have a lot of um, like film festivals and different things, and we're starting to see. Um, more haunted houses and stuff crop up around Halloween. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, do you, well, okay, do, you, do you celebrate Halloween? Yeah, well, it, it's bizarre because we seem to we seem to have the origins of a lot of holidays and then don't actually celebrate them as well as other <laughs> countries. <laughs> right, uh, right. St. Patrick's Day, for example, is one. Uh, everywhere else seems to have... It's huge. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah. in Ireland, it's... Uh, it's huge, but not for the reason that everybody thinks. It is literally huge just for drinking. Yeah, right. nobody cares about anything else <laughs> other than drinking. Um, right, and Halloween's kind of the same. Like the whole backstory of like you have Samhain, and but yeah, again, like we don't really celebrate like in the states or anything. I wish we did. Um, yeah, I, 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 these 
St. Patrick's Day, you know, I, I mentioned I'm from this large Irish Catholic uh, mm-hmm. community. And, and yeah, St. Patrick's Day was, I mean, my father played football for Notre Dame. Oh, wow. You know, so, so, uh, you know, <laughs> it's just, so, yeah, it's just another reason to get shit faced, you know? Yeah, basically. But, but, but where I'm from, like, you know, the, the sun's up is a reason to get shit faced. The sun's down mm-hmm. is another reason to get shit faced. Yeah, that, that kind of <clears throat> sentence, like here. That's like the, yeah. uh, the uproar at the minute in Ireland is about, our pubs and stuff only opened like a week ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. You had to, we had this really bizarre law where you could, you could drink alcohol in a pub so long as they served you food that was worth more than $10. I love it. <laughs> um, so then we replaced that with, well, let's just open everything and you can just do whatever. It was. I, I saw. I saw a, a video that was circulating about uh, four or five guys going to a pub on Sunday and not knowing what to do, like because it was they were always closed on Sunday, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and you had there, there was. A, uh, I seen clips of like guys bringing egg timers in because they were limiting to one hundred and five minutes per person. Oh, really? The guys would bring an egg timer in and then order like five pints or five whiskeys yeah. at a time. Yeah. And just drink yeah. them all one after another, and then do yeah. that for 105 minutes. <laughs> yeah, so well, that's efficient. That's efficient. Um, okay, so uh, where were we before we got sidetracked? Okay, so the plantation thing. So that didn't yeah. that didn't work out then. That that, that didn't work out, and there was those thoughts were resurrected uh, briefly uh, when. Uh, because there was a time because uh, I spent uh, I spent roughly 15 years. Um, in and out of Robert Evans, you know Robert Evans, mm-hmm. his uh, his his uh, his orbit, and uh, we had done a, a horror project. Uh, what brought me to Evans was this horror project, and then at one point, I think we talked to the rights holders of the book, resurrecting it a few years ago, but I, I, we couldn't find any traction anywhere with it. Mm-hmm. It's it's too bad because it's it's uh, it has a lot of the elements. Um, the name isn't great, Myrtles. You know, plantation. That's why I call yeah. it the plantation. Yeah, I kind of like that. Um, I like the plantation. Yeah, yeah, plantation. Because, and the other thing is, you know, there's a there's a, you know, talking about murdered slaves and stuff is, you know, uh, there's a real dark time in American history mm-hmm. with the slaves and and, uh, you know, like they have these slave cabins set up on on that property and it, it's very it's a sensitive su- subject at the moment. Yeah, yeah. I guess steer clear yeah. from that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Segwaying from that then, talking mm-hmm. of uh, violence and horrible things. So I spit on your grave too. Yeah, right. So that, how did that, was that something that you wanted to approach or again, that was, was kind uh, of a natural? That was a call from my agent saying that they were, they had done, uh, I was familiar with I spit, uh, this, the um, Zarki version, you know, from 77 or 76. Mm-hmm. You know, there was there was a time. You know, this this. If I might just digress here for a second, which is unusual for me to digress, but seventies horror films, be it uh, Grave or uh, Last House on the Left or Hills Have Eyes, are very disturbing. Um, they're far more disturbing than the movies that we made in the mid in mid aughts or even now. The reason why they are, and the reason why I never saw Sp- I Spit uh, until I, I got a chance to work on the, the sequel, but. Because uh, the reason why they're they're really off putting, um, and in Texas Chainsaw Massacre as well, because these, these these films were shot on something called the CP16, which is an, I think it's an Aeroflex or might be an Anjanu, not Anjanu, yeah, a Ton camera, which was the same camera that at the time they were shooting news footage on. So okay. when they were making, because these independent filmmakers, be it Romero for Another Living Dead or whatever. Those guys had access to this portable equipment, and that's what made these films look so real. If they look like news footage, mm-hmm. and uh, the, there's some scenes in Last House on the Left in Texas Chainsaw that are so disturbing. My my favorite horror film of all time is is Exorcist, but Exorcist has uh, you know it's got Max von Sydow and it's got big effects. It's Billy Freakin made it. It's 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 much more polished. These other films are very raw. So I hadn't seen Grave, uh, and plus I I, I I suffered under the auspice everyone did. This is about this woman being raped. Yeah, it's and like, mm-hmm. go on. Yeah, no, it just like it's so it's so like I I couldn't I would watch any kind of movie, and I've seen 
probably a lot of real life stuff as well that I wish I didn't. But there's something yeah, yeah. about uh, that whole rape kind of slash. I don't know what it is, but it just makes it like super hard to watch. Yeah, and that's and that's actually why I did it because uh, my agent uh, called and said that they had uh, they had made it they had made a remake in 2010. And, um, I saw that and I thought it was really well done, Mm -hmm. really well done. Yeah, it was. And, and, uh, Lisa Hansen and Neil Elman and Paul Hertzberg were looking to do it again. And I said, well, I don't know, I don't know what they can, you can do with it. It's, you know, it's a woman gets raped and she kills everybody, rapes her behind the story. And, uh, she said, well, they have this interesting idea to go to Bulgaria and they want to start in the U S and these guys attack this girl and they, 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 (laughs) <laughs> they weaken and Bernie's her onto a plane and then take her to Bulgaria. I said, that sounds terrible. It's not, it's not interesting that it's in Bulgaria, but it sounds terrible that they're going to like drug her up yeah, and put sunglasses way. on yeah. her, you know? So, uh, and then they said they don't know what to do then. And then they had kind of like a loose idea. And I thought about it. My agent, uh, Cheryl, uh, has been my agent for a long time. She's really, uh, really cool, uh, tough, uh, I call her a chick, but she'd beat me up if I call her a chick. Um, she said, you know, I Spit was a kick-ass movie because it was one of the first movies where the girls fight back. And so it's important that you that you realize that, you know, girls fighting back is important. So you should look at it like under that vein. And so I did. I went back and I said, you know, a lot of times you'll see a lot of movies, the bad guys will break into the house, rape the wife, and then kill her. Right? Yeah. And then that'll be the impetus for Max Payne to go after Whoever the hell, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, what's her name? I can't remember her name, but but what this movie does, this movie concentrates on the horror of being raped, the horror, like the ho- it's terrible, it's terrible, and this this needs to be answered to, and you need to like I just last night on Twitter, somebody reached out to me and said, you know, this this scenes are really hard to watch. I said, yeah, it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be hard to watch because it's it's a terrible thing. You know, movies, are, movies, are, the one job of a movie is to affect you. If you can sit there and watch I Spit or I Spit 2 and not squirm, there's something wrong with you. Yeah, it's like, you know? and I and I feel like I have quite a, um, like a solid foundation for watching basically anything, but oh, yeah. man, so, and, and now, it, uh, obviously in a good way, I don't mean that as in like a, don't look at this movie or don't watch this movie, yeah, but yeah. like it's, it's, it's done so well. Yeah, that it's, it's just like super and Gemma hard Dolling, to say true. Gemma uh, is is brutal. Like so, when I think of that movie, uh, I think of the trailer, and I think of all the biblical references, and I think of the church, and I think of the cop, and I think of the end. I don't really think of the middle, you know, um, the rapey part because it's brutal, and I don't like it. And mm-hmm. you know, my mother, God rest her, she passed away a few years ago. She went to the grave never seeing anything I've ever written. She's only seen the my, my name in the credits. You know, oh, my really? brother will bring the DVD. Goes, Mom, Tom wrote this. Here, w- want to see it? Nope. You can watch the first three minutes of it, then the credits. You know, um, and when that when that thing, when that opportunity came around, I um, I just thought that because I'm, I'm a big believer. I think I mentioned Red before mm-hmm. about the Little Red Riding Hood. I'm a big believer in strong female. Now, that, you know, that's what we called them back then. I just called them characters. I don't think the, the strong females. I think it's just you know you have to cool kick-ass characters period whether they be male or female but i always was known for writing strong female characters and um so my agent called and said they were looking for an idea and i and i i I, they had said that the ideas baked in and all the stuff and these are the parameters and i can't remember what the original take was but um i walked into that and i met with those guys and i just said to them i said my one word pitch to them was catacombs and they go what do you mean i said well you know, we, I, they're going to rape this girl. They're going to really hurt her. They're going to want to get rid of the body. They're going to bury her, and she's going to fall through a sinkhole into these catacombs that exist in this ancient city. And she's going to use these these catacombs to enact her vengeance, you know. And um, they go, that's perfect, right? <clears throat> Maybe they didn't say it was perfect. They, they, I got a call like a, seven minutes later saying I got the job. And I read a review the other day that, that, that equated I Spit 2 to like a French Nouveau film about resurrection and stuff because it's, you know, it's the innocence being crushed and the innocence rising up again from underneath the city. And um, I actually stand by that film 
because uh, it, 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 if you're going to act like a predator, be prepared to pay in blood mm-hmm. what's going to happen to you, you know? And it was a good experience. It was one of my better experiences because uh, I like work with Lisa Hansen. And uh, Steve Monroe was a very talented director. And we cranked that script out. Um, my mother had broken her hip. This was years ago, obviously. And so I went back to Rochester to help her. And I was writing this movie at the same time. I think I mentioned that in the book. And um, it was a very collaborative uh, experience. I didn't get, to, I, they asked, I wanted to go to Bulgaria to hang out, but they, they were like, yeah, they that's shut what them. I was going to ask. Yeah, they, they shot that movie so quickly. Um, because there's not a lot of money behind those movies, mm-hmm. but they uh, they did a really good job. You know, Monroe's a very talented guy. Monroe shoots and operates at the same time. I don't know if he does it all the time, but I know he does that most most of the time. And Lisa's a great Lisa Hansen's made like 300 movies. You know, Iron um, Cinetel makes you know was the king of the 90s. Uh, and it was, it was it was a very good experience. And I did write a I did write a, th- a third. Uh, I wrote a really cool three. Yeah, I was just going to uh, ask about that because, uh, like, I feel like, I know they mightn't have been, like, huge blockbusters, but I feel like they mm. they went really well. And, like, the general consensus seems to be, like, a lot of people, obviously they're hard to watch, et cetera, et cetera, but yeah. a lot of people like them and it has a really good following. Yeah, I, 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 they they do. And I, uh, I, had, I had gotten the green light to write a third and I, and I had written a... I, I don't. I didn't see what they made. I didn't see the vengeance is mine, which is you know my title from two. I that was baked into my draft in two, but I don't know what theirs was about. Mine was about you know a self help group that actually is a bunch of vigilantes. Um, they, they 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 brought the original cast back. They brought back the original Jennifer Butler and brought back the original um, Camille Camille Keaton. I think her name is um, the actress from the seventy seven seventy six. And they were all going to be like these vigilante girls that walk around killing people and. Um, um, for some reason that didn't go, I don't know why, but, uh, no harm, no foul. I went off and did something else, but the, um, let's see something about grave. Um, you know, like I said, you know, the best horror movies get, they keep you out. They, they, they make you unsettled. I mean, there's, there's no scene more unsettling than the one in, in, in the exorcist where she's using a crucifix to masturbate with yeah. the 12 year old girl. Yeah. There's no, there's no, you can't, that's just it, man. You're not going to come up with a better or worse scene than that. I had the honor of meeting the Romero Foundation uh, board a few months ago, right before COVID hit. I uh, went to Hollywood and met with these guys. Really, you know, George, this is really a little, little, little plug for them. They're 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 putting together in in Pitt University in Pittsburgh. They're putting together like a George Romero school of filmmaking. Oh wow! Yeah, which is really awesome, and they're really good people. But I took a lot, I took some heat from somebody at that dinner. These movies just about people being raped. And I said that if they affect you, they're doing their job, you know. And um, and uh, I think Katie, when she comes back and takes those dudes out, I think she takes off in a very smart way. I always have issue with her being able to lift that one guy up to the wall, but that's okay. I, I look past that. But uh, you know, I think it's, I think it's a I think it's an enjoyable movie. I yeah, really do. Yeah, no, I do, I do, and and. And very few times um, you see a movie like that come out and then have a uh, a sequel equally, if not better, than the original. That doesn't happen too often. Support First Class Horror on Patreon for as little as $1. Can't get enough of the horror? Carve yourself a deal from official merchandise only on Teespring. Join us on all social media at First Class Horror. We have such sights to show you. 